Uh, we have got a very special edition of Ask GC Anything this week because we are joined by Mr. Grand Tours himself, uh, Adam Hansen of Lotto Sudal, embarking on his 19th Grand Tour in a row and he has completed them all, quite mind-boggling. Uh, we'll get straight into the questions that we've received from viewers. Uh, the first one from Neil Moss. Really interesting this one, have we reached peak bike, uh, i.e. the point at which new tech materials and shapes really make no difference anymore? Or do you think that more performance machines can be wrung out of the UCI's current rules? Oh, for sure. Um, there's so many bikes. Okay, there are some bikes that are really aerodynamic with integrated brakes, um, integrated cablings and that, but there's so many bikes that aren't. Um, and the, uh, if you look at the Specialized, uh, I don't even know what the model's called, that has the integrated brakes and cable, it's still around the 7.8 kilogram mark. So, you know, this can be improved quite a lot if it wants to get down to the 6.8 kilos. Um, but in terms of aerodynamics, I think uh, things can go a long way in that sense. Even within the UCI's current rules? Within, well, yeah, if you look at um, the most aerodynamic bikes at the moment, integrated cabling and brakes, they're well and truly over a kilo of the, the UCI limit. Um, and the ones that are on board with the UCI limits, um, yeah, they're, they're not so aero. at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not at all parachutes. Okay, uh, next up from Pat CRC 99 uh, what percentage of times more or less has the race gone the way of the management thought it would? Uh, race plan gone the way the management thought it would? Quite a lot. Um, if there was a percentage, it'd probably be, uh, I would, well, uh, I hope they don't read this, <laughs> but probably more than 50% it goes uh, the wrong way. Um, but that's, uh, that's also like, it. if you say your own team, um, like they, they all put a, a team tactic and what we should do, okay, a lot of times it doesn't go wrong, but their thoughts of what the other teams would do, okay, that's, that's more often, definitely, yeah. the predictions uh, of the outcome. Yeah, because you can have any plan, but you, you don't know what the other teams are going to, to do before the start, or you can, you can guess it. This is what I always say, the, the really interesting thing about cycling is, it's not basketball, football, or soccer, whatever you want to call it, where it's one team versus the other team and you can sort of predict what the other team does. You know, there's 22 teams racing. They all got different agendas. Um, and, you know, it can be someone's birthday and they just want to, you know, have a sprint finish for them yeah. and they got no chance. So it's very hard to predict every single team. So anything can happen and it's, just, it's very unpredictable. Okay. Uh, next up, also on Instagram from Paddy Sniper. Uh, a lot of experienced pros say that with age comes some fear on the bike, uh, which stops them going for results. Has this ever affected you, barring your, your two stage wins at the Grand Tours? Um, good question. <laughs> it's actually crossed my mind a few times. Uh, I think I think when you're young, you, you sort of you're more um, more wild to attack, to do it any time. And when when you get a bit older, maybe yeah, maybe you maybe you um, yeah maybe you settle down a little. Um, yeah, it's probably half true. I think yeah. Yeah, my personal question then. Uh, I mean, I've been out of the peloton for a few years now, but it does seem on TV like everything's even more, even closer than it was six, seven years ago in terms of the fact that there's, there's so many lead out trains and so many very organized teams. Yeah, well, especially in today's era, I do believe that the, the low of the low of riders, the, the top guys are getting better, but I think the big difference is the lower riders are getting much better. So, yeah. so um, I think in today's peloton, everyone's a bit even, and that makes it a lot more difficult. So, yeah. yeah. But with regards to the question, um, I think yeah, the older you get, you're more. I don't know. You're more probably more t or too calculating. You know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah overthink too many, too many things. Where young guys are just. I'll just go out and attack and yeah. whenever, and sometimes it works. Oh, to be young again. Oh, yeah. um, right, next up, uh, Ty Muir. Uh, Mr. Hansen, very polite, is not bound by heritage or technical dogma. Uh, he uses long cranks, narrow bars, and he always wondered what you thought about oval <laughs> chain rings. I love oval chain rings. I would love to be on them, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm not allowed to use them. And I've deba I made debates, and I've argued, and I just can't use them. If I, if and I've even th thought about, you know, is it, are they worth changing teams to be able to use them? I'd love to try them, they make total sense. I have, sorry, I have tried them for two weeks um, because what I wanted to do is I wanted to try them before um, actually going to the team and, you know, um, putting my case up. So I thought I'd try them. If I like them, I'll um, try my best to convince them. Because it'd be worse thing is if you convince your team to use them and then you uh, use them for one week and yeah. you don't like it and didn't want to go that way. But I, I really do like them. I do think they make sense and I felt, I felt really good with them. But, um, 
for just not that reason. And do you think that's why we don't see more pros using them? It's just it's just a sponsor thing with teams. I think mostly it's because of sponsors, and also um, goes back to that heritage thing. You know, uh, especially in cycling, people don't like change, and there's a lot of guys that don't like change. Well, I'm open to try everything, and yeah. I would definitely try it, which I did, and um, I think they're I think. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting from a public point of view because Oval Chain Rings effectively have won five up out of the last six Tours de France, so they can't be that bad. No, they cannot yeah. be that bad. Uh, okay, next up, uh, Blair Cool. Uh, this is interesting. He asked why shoes, and apparently he's asked you this before. Uh, is it a deep-seated fetish uh, is what he wants to know, but he says your answer is an interesting one to this. Why shoes? Rotational mass is the most important thing in weight. Uh, so if you want to uh, look at it like a racing car point of view, um, if you say, okay, you want to make the, the car a better performer, it's not changing wheels. It's, um, it goes back to the crank, it goes back to the rods, it goes to the pistons of the engine, the flywheel, the drive shaft, and then it's the wheels. And in cycling, we only focus on the wheels. Um, because you know, if you have lighter wheels, it feels so much better. And if you have lighter shoes, lighter pedals, lighter cranks, lighter chain, this is far more important than lighter rims. So um, it, it's, it's actually a big difference in saving power. So yeah, shoes is a, is a big thing. Yeah. Uh, okay, next up, David Stickman. Uh, is Australia's Croc Trophy one of the hardest races because of the terrain and environment over the nine days, or is it just the harsh uh, accommodation or lack of overnight? And do the Europeans who race it go back and say WTF with those conditions? <laughs> um, well, back when I was doing it, it was 14 days long. It was much longer. The stages were much longer. And it was Darwin to Cairns, which is much harder. And it was a lot hot, a lot more hot. Yes, there's, um, you have to put up your tent by yourself. You have to clean your bike by yourself. And that's very hard after, I think we even had some 200 kilometer days on the mountain bike, which is extremely hard. Uh, I loved it, I thought it was wonderful. One year I went with three teammates from an Austrian team and after the third day, they were really WTF and they left their bikes there <laughs> and they took the next media because the media had to send the tapes um, on a, on a, on a four-wheel drive to uh, some remote airport to get it on TV and they, they, they couldn't take the bikes and they said, look, you, you can come, but we don't have room for your bikes. And they're like, the bikes can stay, we just want to go home and they were meant to have a week holiday in Australia after that. They just went straight back to Austria. <laughs> so it can be tough. I probably should have given a bit of background on the Crocodile Trophy, but it's yeah, stage race done on mountain bikes, off-road, of course, where you're pretty self-sufficient, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, th did you win it before? Before you started your pro career? Uh, two times. Yeah, twice. Yeah, no. sorry, I should have researched that beforehand, <laughs> but I knew Adam was very successful in that event. Uh, next up, Chris Blockley, once again on the shoes. How hard is it to pick the shoes for each Grand Tour? Uh, do you just grab the closest or newest set or do you have them made purposely before each tour? A uh, bit of both. Um, I always change the shoes, uh, different layup on the carbon, different light, trying to get them lighter, more comfortable. Um, and it's really trial and error. So I like to bring new shoes to a new uh, Grand Tour. Uh, but sometimes it is just the pair that works, I just bring. Uh, okay, next up from Peter Dash. Uh, do you have any thoughts about trying some one-day classics uh, when the Grand Tour run comes to an end? I mean, I've done some research here, actually. Uh, Adam's done 11 classics uh, versus 25 Grand Tours, so you do favour the stage races a little bit. Yeah, I do. Recently, I haven't done uh, many classics at all. Uh, the only classic I think I haven't done is Flanders, and I would like to try it before I retire. Uh, but I've done Roubaix. Uh, yeah, I've been once in Ramel heaps of times. Um, you know, the thing is with doing all the Grand Tours, there's so many other beautiful races you miss. You can't, you can't do everything. And if I do all the races on my race program this year, I'll have 101 race days, which is um, more than 20% of an average rider. And to throw in, you know, all the, all the one-day uh, classics, which are extremely hard races, is just too much. So I can't be greedy. Yeah, and they take quite a lot of, you know, it's a one-day classic, but they take a fair oh, amount of preparation time up, don't they, and recovery straight afterwards just as to, well. Just to down talk my Grand Tours a little, um, yeah, we have easy days in Grand Tours. Yeah. Sprint days, breakaway goals, you just soft pedal until last 40 kilometres, then you go full. One-day race, it's, yeah, it takes yeah, five days. stressful recover. as well. Yeah. Uh, next up then, your plans after cycling. I'm not sure when you're planning on retiring, but uh, what will you do with that extra time that you have 
uh, when you don't have three grand tours a year to keep you occupied? That was on Instagram from JT Sub. Uh, I like to leave my um, after cycling a bit private. Um, but you'll never see me ever again. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, no. <laughs> well, at least we've got you here now then. Uh, Matthew Park asks, how do you treat your saddle sore after each ride? I understand you were suffering a little bit from that uh, at the Tour de France. A recommendation is taking time off the bike. You don't have that luxury. Do you just ignore the pain or keep riding? Have you got any tips? Um, well, I did take, after every Grand Tour, I take seven days off the bike. Um, so I did this also, and uh, just tend to love and care as much as you can. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Uh, two more questions then I think we'll go with before we finish this week's Ask GC Anything. Uh, Matty Anderson wants to know that out of all of the Grand Tour stages you have raced, which would you say was the toughest of them all? And uh, more research here on my part, I think Adam has completed 475 Grand Tour stages, uh, which is quite incredible a year and a third of his life basically spent doing Grand Tour stages, not including all of the rest days and you know, the preparation time before each one. But what was the toughest one? Can you single, single one out? I don't remember what year. I'm going to guess 2013 or 2014 in the Belter on that um, Endora stage. Right, yeah. When it was raining, I think 25 riders pulled out. Yeah, I think it was 2013, yeah. Yeah, it was, fr it was freeze. It was, oh, it was so bad. It was so bad. It was, like really when you're shaking so much you, your handlebars are yeah. and oh, oh. that was the worst that was um if there wasn't a car next to me to jump into i think i would have stopped yeah <laughs> so you had to get to the finish to um for your life yeah well it must have been bad if you were able to single out one from 475. uh okay let's choose a last question uh, I am going to go with what's your favourite memory uh, from all of those Grand Tours that you've raced and I'm going to put a caveat in here that you can't choose one of the two stage wins that you've had. Oh. <laughs> um, favourite memory? Well there's a few. I think the most satisfying thing is when we do a lead out with Andre, and you just have the whole team out in front, the whole, like every guy does a perfect job, and you just make it look so easy when it's not, and Andre finishes it off. That's, um, you know, we had quite a few in 2014, 15, and this is, this is probably the nicest, nicest feeling when you do your job, you do your job, and you do it 100%, and you swing off, you see the next guy go, and you see your train out in front, and everything just goes in line, and you see Greg Henderson puts his hands up in the air, and when he does that, you know that Andre's won. Yeah. You know, and that's, um, that's pretty nice and special. Yeah, you must have been a part of the majority of Andre's Grand Tour stage wins uh, since you've been doing them all for the last few years. Yeah, my whole career I've been on the same team as Andre ever yeah. since uh, 2007. And yeah, if I've done all the Grand Tours and I've been part of all his yeah. Grand Tour wins. Okay, I'm going to actually uh, do another question from my own point of view. Will you watch a Grand Tour when you're not doing it because it, it, it's been a few years probably since you've seen what's, without being unkind, what's happening at the front on a mountain stage of a Grand Tour. You can always get asked my mum, how, how, did you see the finish today? I was like, no, I did not see yeah. the finish. I was not part of the first group. Um, will I? Well, yeah, maybe in the background. Maybe, maybe. In the background yeah. of what I'm doing. Well, I hope we don't, you don't disappear completely from the sport when you finish. It'd be great to hear you commentating on some of the Grand Tours uh, when you have retired from cycling. Thanks very much to Adam Hansen to, uh, for joining us for this Ask GCN thing, but we will bring things to a close now because I'm sure he's got better things to do uh, than spend time with us here at GCN. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the network already, you can do so by clicking on the globe. A couple more videos related to Adam. Last year at a tour, uh, he went through his suitcase, which was incredibly interesting. It included a satellite phone and a Rubik's Cube, amongst many other things. That is just down here. And actually, I think in the same year as the toughest stage that you did, uh, we followed you around the Vuelta Espana, I think, for a rider's diary. Uh, it's lost in GCN's archive, but you can find it right now by clicking just down there.